Okay, there it is. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shweta Arya. I'm the Outreach Director for Deliver Interfaith Power and Light. And we are very, um, we would like to welcome you all for joining us this evening. I know we all have, um, have lots of Zoom calls and lots of webinars online to attend. And we are very fortunate that you chose us this evening. So welcome, and um, you know, in a little bit, Lisa will introduce our guest speakers. But I'll just take a minute to introduce ourselves because I see lots, lots of new faces here, and uh, some of you might not know uh, about Delivered into Faith, Power, and Light. So I'll just take a few minutes to introduce ourselves, some of our programs, and, and then I'll give it on to Lisa, who will introduce our. Uh, our guest speakers, and then share more about Climate Conversation program. Um, so um, Delaware Interfaith Power and Light, we are a faith-based environmental nonprofit. And our, where is my next slide? And our mission is to work with um, um, is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and and our community partners to um, you know take a bold and just action on climate change. You know we believe that um, climate change is the biggest um, a public health emergency and it is the biggest humanitarian crisis right now we are dealing in. So we really. Um, want to share the urgency of the situation and we want to get people together to act on climate change. So we work with our uh, interfaith partners um, and our community partners. Um, and there are a few ways um, we help address the situation. So we have some very practical and tangible programs um, like uh, Climate Conversation, um, our faith efficiency audits, uh, which I'll just touch on in a little bit. So we have programs in place, then we have educational opportunities like climate conversation and our webinars. So we inform people about why it is important to act on climate change. Um, you know, so uh, educational opportunities. And, and the third leg of the uh, whole equation is um, to advocate for clean energy policies. Because you know that's where we create the political will to really make that big difference. So advocacy is a big part of the work that we do. Um, so I hope you can um, engage with us. So how we really work is we uh, work with our um, you know um, houses of faith, um, and we want them to become these models of sustainability, right? They, so they can. Um, get themselves to, you know, we work together with their green teams. We um, want to ensure that they can establish some green practices in the congregation itself um, and, and then reach out to their community at large and, and share their knowledge um, and, you know, about their programs. And when it comes time for advocate, advocating for these clean energy, energy policies, we want to work together with them. So we want to create this network all around the state of Delaware. So Delaware Interfaith Power and Light is, uh, you know, is also part of national IPO. Um, Nash, uh, we have around 40 state affiliates all over uh, the United States. Um, so we, you know, we, it's a national network. And, um, and I hope that if you have, uh, if you'd like to stay connected with us, um, you know, our, um, so uh, you can join our monthly subscription list um, so we, we can inform you about our upcoming programs or about our advocacy efforts. So these are some of our core programs. Faith efficiencies, which is an energy audit for congregations. Um, and right now, um, so faith efficiencies is, um, is funded by Energize Delaware. Um, and right now, if, if your congregation would like to get an energy audit, which is really the first step where you want to get started on your clean energy journey is reduce your carbon footprint. So we can help you with that. And right now this energy audit, which can be, which can go up till $3,000, depending on how big your congregation is, you can do that for free of cost up till June. So there's still time for you to get that energy audit done and you can contact Lisa to schedule an energy audit. 
So that's one of the programs. Um, if you would like to consider solar for your congregation, you know, we have plenty of resources for you. So, um, you know, we can guide you in the right direction. We have several congregations who've gone solar, so we can connect you with them. So if you want to get started in that clean energy journey, you know, we, we are here to help you with that. Climate conversation, just like that is taking place right now. And Lisa will touch on more, uh, you know, touch and share more about the climate conversation program, which is also funded by Energize Delaware. Um, Windows of Hope program, you know, we really feel um, that, you know, with climate change, climate change is going to impact us all, but mainly it's going to impact the frontline communities, which are already marginalized, which are already struggling, um, you know, to, uh, you know, they are already hand to mouth and they are not contributing to this problem but they will be the first and worst to get hit by climate change. Um, so Windows of Hope program really um, is meant for low-income communities. Okay, I'm on my, um, and, I'm facilitating something at the end, so we need my facilitator's guide. We'd ask everyone to turn your mics off um, for the time being. Um, so, you know, window, Windows of Hope program is basically a interior strong window construction program where it is built by community members and it is built for community members. So it can reduce their utility bills. So we, we know that um, low income folks pay much more for their utility bills than, um, you know, than um, a high income uh, household. So we help them reduce that um, utility bill for them. So it's a very boots on the ground kind of a program. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I'm happy to give you more details about it. Sacred grants for congregation. I mean, that's really close to my heart. It is in a very, very pilot stage right now. So we are still gathering our partners together. Um, you know, we, we know that we are really going through a biodiversity crisis. You know, um, we, we really need to, and, and I know our guest speakers will touch on that, how, uh, you know, we need to convert a lot of our turf and land into um, native landscaping, you know, to really help our ecosystem services. So we really believe our uh, congregations can address that part. Uh, you know, lots, uh, lots of land is occupied by faith-based organizations. So if even a small percentage of the land can be converted into pollinator habitats, into rain gardens, you know, uh, into community gardening programs. We can address a lot of these issues. So Sacred Ground um, is a certification program for National Wildlife Federation. And we are trying to launch that in Delaware, so very early stages. Um, but if you're interested in that program, you can contact me about that. And how do we address climate change without involving our youth? So um, we uh, started, kickstarted this youth climate initiative last year, um, which is also a spill off of climate conversation. So we have brought together some of the campuses um, and high schools together. Um, you know, we meet on a monthly basis and have these climate conversations to address sustainability at the campus level. And you know, unifying these youth and um, bringing them together to advocate for climate, you know, clean energy policies. And last but not least, you know, advocating for equitable climate policies in in our state. Um, and with that, I will uh, now ask Lisa. Lisa, if you want to share um, that quick video uh, for Sacred Grounds, and then we can start our climate conversation. All right. Okay, let's see if I can do this. All right. Oops. Let's see. Get rid of this so we can see.
was praying and I was asking the Lord, what, what was I supposed to be doing in this community? And the response that I got was, if you don't build up the community, you're not going to have a church. Sacred Grounds by the National Wildlife Federation. There's a Garden for Wildlife program for faith communities, encouraging them to create habitat in their on their properties and educate their congregations and their communities about it. This is Christ the King Church. We're a Catholic church in Northwest Detroit. The environmental aspect is to provide native pollinator habitat and habitat for all sorts of native critters. So pollinators, you think bees and butterflies and birds and things like that. We came up with the uh, vision to create a prayer park we are sitting right in the middle of a sacred ground space that we call our community prayer park. We filled out this application for these free flowers, unknowing that we were applying to sacred ground. And that's how we were able to actually get our uh, plants and get them planted. Here's our plans for our labyrinth area. Uh, we've been working with the uh, National Wildlife Federation, but we'd like to do this in the fall and then hopefully in the spring, rearrange these grasses and this area over here. This is Meditation Missionary Baptist Church and the Hope House is our community outreach project. What we're doing is we're clearing out up to this point and we're gonna, we're gonna dig it out all the way down, probably 100 and 150 feet, and plant all, all of our flowers. The idea is there's basic tenants. Do you have to reach beyond your faith community into the community at large and encourage them to participate in these best practices? If we want to continue to exist in an environment that's good for us and healthy for humans, then we need to make it healthy for the, for the other species that we share space with as well. We're at the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo in Perrysburg, Ohio. There's a lot of milkweed in the area, which is a, a nice attractor for pollinators. So we do have a lot of bees, a lot of monarchs. We're gonna move these grasses around in more of like a semi-circle. So, and then you come to the path and you'll have another bench or so, and you'll be able to sit here and relax. This space is where we're going to be doing the Sacred Grounds project. The rain garden will be good because it'll gather the storm water from our downspouts, and it'll also provide habitat for native pollinators. Sacred Grounds have really stepped up to the plate and showed their commitment, not just to nature, but to the community in providing the funding that is needed to complete this project. I teach about a variety of things, but this is one of my favorite because it's so rare when your spiritual path, your academic interest and your vocation collide. And that's exactly what Sacred Grounds is to me. The whole uh, planning structure of Sacred Grounds really helped to restore and to revitalize the, the ecosystem even around here. And so our prayer garden has really become that real focal point of caring about what God has put in our hands. In Islam, the environment is an important part of, of the religion. God created this earth for us, and we're supposed to take care of it. I had a lot of interconnections with other denominations and it was great. It was very enlightening. You cross borders on faith and, and religions and it was very it was very open and refreshing. I'm just so thankful to the National Wildlife Federation. They had the thought to put faith communities in as a sector of our community that could touch lives. Because we do touch lives. I mean that's why we we're here. We're here to serve others. The entry to the prayer park, uh, those steps you walk up, it was the entryway into a drug house. I'm a retired police sergeant. I frequented that house um, in my day of policing. When they finally boarded it up, that's when we moved in. 
So before, when I walked up those steps, it was a sense of, uh, of rage, a sense of sadness. And now when I walk up those steps, it's a sense of peace, restoration, and hope. I've had other people come and ask me, how can I do this on my street? And so it's catching, it's catching on. I realize that this thing is bigger than me. That was inspiring. <laughs> so I am, I'm Lisa Locke and I'm the director of programs for Delaware Interfaith Power and Light. And I'm um, really pleased to welcome you to share this climate conversation with us. Um, this is a wonderful program, as Shveta said, funded by Energize Delaware. They're an important organization for you to know about. They are a 501c3. Uh, they were created by our general assembly to manage the energy funds that come into the state. So that's millions of dollars. And they use that money to put into programs to support energy efficiency, um, renewable energy projects in commercial, residential, farming, faith communities, schools, all the different sectors. Um, so we, and we managed um, two of their programs, the one for the energy audits for faith communities and then the, the climate conversations. So we've been doing this for about two years now. And the idea of Climate Conversations is to bring people together in safe and respectful settings <clears throat> so that they can share candidly and openly their perceptions of climate change, their confusions, their concerns, their fears, their hopes, and then to find those areas of common ground where we can work together to address those, those concerns. And to date, we've done around almost 30 of them engaging over 900 people around the state. So it's been pretty cool, whether it's library groups or schools or faith communities or community centers. So this is something that if any of you are interested in being a host with us, a co-hosting, we would love to do that with you. As Shveta said, also out of this, we started the Delaware Intercampus Climate Coalition, which is very cool. So this is um, the college campuses throughout the state and some high schools. And we've been meeting on a monthly basis, doing our own climate conversations together, bringing the campuses together. Um, so we're very excited about that program and making intergenerational programs. So, um, so you're gonna be part of a climate conversation today. So some of you have been in these before, but, um, but others, this will be new and I will uh, we'll be going to small groups a little later and I'll give you a little heads up uh, when we get to that point. But right now I really want to welcome Jen and Blake and so appreciative of them joining us tonight. Um, this is really exciting. Um, let's see here. Let me introduce them a little bit. Uh, you may have seen their bios already, but Jen Volk is the Associate Director of the University of Delaware's Cooperative Extension. And she's also an environmental quality extension specialist. She received both her undergraduate degree in chemistry and graduate degree in marine studies from the University of Delaware. She, and then following grad school, she worked at the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control in their watershed, watershed assessment section as an environmental specialist, scientist. At UD, Jennifer continues her work on environmental issues in Delaware and the region, but has also broadened it to include climate change impacts and responses. So she serves on UD's, as a UD liaison to the Northeast Climate Hubs University Partnership Network, where she coordinates with other research and extension professionals in the region on climate change initiatives. Blake Moore, who, um, as he says, is a longtime lover of the outdoors, pursued his bachelor's in natural resources management from UD also. Um, he began working in the private environmental consulting sector, and then after graduation, moved to state service in agriculture and national resources. 
He's currently a horticulture and natural resources extension agent with the UD Cooperative Extension, where he's working with citizens to provide education and outreach on environmental and natural resource conservation. And he's the state program coordinator for the new Delaware Master Naturalist Program, which has the potential to create strong networks of volunteers and organizations with the distinct goal of helping provide a better world for Delaware. So we're so excited to have them. Jen and Blake, take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa and Shweta for the invitation. I know Blake and I are very excited to be here with everyone tonight. And, and we're looking forward to sharing what we know about some of the benefits, um, climate benefits, that our natural and working lands offer. And so I thought that video that you showed, I was looking at urban green spaces all over the place. So Blake's gonna be talking about that in a few minutes. So before we share our screen and get into our presentation, uh, Shweta's prepared um, a poll, and I know either she or Lisa is gonna launch that. So we wanna just kind of get a sense of who's here first and what your um, relationship is to the land. So the first poll question, I haven't seen it launch yet, but I'll, I'll let you know when I do. I was gonna ask you if you own or manage land. And then the second one, here it is, is, um, is so if you answer yes, then please tell us how many acres about you manage. And um, you know, I'll let you know. So I, I live in a neighborhood in Smyrna. I have probably about an eighth of an acre and I'm still paying a mortgage, but I consider that managing the land. That's my property that I'm taking care of. So I would click off yes and less than, 0.25 acres. We'll just give everyone a moment to do that and then hopefully we'll be able to share the results so we can all see you know, the, the sense of how much land people are managing in our group tonight. Should I end the poll now? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't fill it out myself, so you maybe if everyone else said you'd have 19 or roughly, I'd say if you have more than 15, that, that's pretty much everybody, including those of us organizing. Then are you able to share the results? Yeah. Okay, so 94% do own or manage the land. And so for those of you who don't, I still think you're gonna get something out of this presentation because there are other groups and organizations that you could work with where you could have some influence on how land around you is managed. So maybe you have um, a, a, some sort of HOA if you're even in an um, apartment or condo type of complex, they have land around them. So you could be influential with that um, or, or just within in your communities too. Um, and so for most folks, it looks like, again, most folks are like me, you have small little properties, but we have a couple people who do have larger amounts. And I know I saw in the chat, I think it was Margaret or Maggie. Um, yep, Margaret Moore, she's got 24 acres in Pennsylvania. So um, there's a couple of people out there who have a lot of land to manage. So hopefully you'll get something interesting out of this presentation tonight. And then I have a little bit to add, I have to add a little bit too, Jen. And for those who are like Jen and myself, where I probably have a little bit even less than an eighth of an acre too, but I do a lot of fantastic things on there, which we'll talk about later. It's, it's good to see small landowners and managers here because sometimes we think our little tiny plot is not gonna do much. And I argue to say that us together, we can make a real impact by doing stuff on small land. So I appreciate you guys being here. Yep, that's a great point, Blake. And thank you because that, that is sort of the message is that even though we, we may all have these little bits, little bits together add up to be quite a bit and we can be influential. So the next question is just to kind of get a sense for what kind of land you have. And so these questions are gonna be land use types. So is it um, a lawn or a landscaped area um, ranging to natural wetlands or forests and um, agriculture? And Shweta is working on getting that launched as well. <laughs> Doing great. I'm glad you're doing it and not me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's wonderful. Everyone's so understanding about these things because we all go through it. Well, see, normally in this type of this this 
this little bit, you have a dog barking in the background or Jen's supposed to sing or something like that to take up time, right? And that what's supposed she to happen? dog get up and do a tree pose. Yeah. So ready. <laughs> no. but, uh... <laughs> All right. All right, get your stretching in. <laughs> Would you like to move on? I'm not sure if you're, if you're having technical difficulties. I can launch my yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Can, yes. I, I don't know why this is not showing. Okay. Just just ask. Let's like so. I mean, it, it, like, do you have forests? Is most people just a yard, meadows? What type of things? Just go ahead and throw that in the chat. Yeah. yeah, you can put it in the chat, and then and Blake can monitor that while I kind of get things started. <laughs> Renee's got some hand. <laughs> She's got some trees, I think. <laughs> Great. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Share in the chat and we'll, we'll move on. So tonight, as I said, Blake and I are here to tell you about some of the climate benefits of our natural and working land. So um, before I jump into that, I just wanted to um, step back a little bit and just talk about Delaware's climate goals in general. And so um, our colleagues who work at the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control have really been working on climate issues for many years now. They've done a lot of sea level rise planning, and now they're working on uh, looking forward into different, some, uh, different climate scenarios. So they really want to try to maximize our resiliency to the changing climate. So that means we're going to be able to adapt and deal with the changes that are coming, but they're also trying Jen, to do some of that. Can I, yes. Jennifer? Yes. Can I interrupt you? Can I launch sure. the poll? Would you like me to you launch the poll now? Ready, sure. There we go. So the, the choices that we've provided you are lawn and landscape areas, natural meadows and grasses, wetlands, forests, or cropland. So we'll talk about some of these land use types um, in a few minutes. Do raised beds cost, are, are raised beds counting as uh, cropland? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Hmm. I'm gonna say I'd probably put that more into lawn and landscaped areas, but I'll no. let you judge. <laughs> yeah, they're not lawn and they're not landscape. So it is, you're, you're growing vegetables and, and maybe herbs. All right, Shweto, do you think you have enough responses? And we'll look at the results. Okay. Yeah, so most folks have the lawn and the landscape areas, but it looks like we have some, some of you um, who are managing some of the natural areas and the working lands like forest and cropland. So great, it gives us a good sense for who's here tonight and what you might be most interested in. So please, um, I'm fine with people put in questions into the chat. Blake can monitor for me and I'll monitor for him. So uh, feel free to interrupt me um, or you can un unmute and shout out if you have questions too. So I was talking about the climate goals for the state. So they're trying to really maximize our resiliency, but then also trying to um, mitigate our, the, the, the changing climate. So reducing the emissions as well. So there are goals to reduce the emissions by 26 to 28% from the 2005 levels by 2025. That's like just around the corner, right? The good news is, is we're well on track to do that, but the low hanging fruit's always the easiest stuff to do, you know? So the, the, the next couple of things we need to do are probably gonna take a little bit more time and effort. So you then may wonder, um, where are the greenhouse gases in our state coming from? This is data from the 2017 greenhouse gas inventory that is prepared by the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And so you can see our big sectors are transportation, the industrial sector, and the electric power sector, with smaller emission sources coming from the re residential and commercial sectors, and then agriculture and waste management. So I'll, I'll no, I'm going to be talking about agriculture next, but um, the sources coming from agriculture are when you have um, emissions from livestock or from the cropland itself. And we know that the... Um, the protocols that they use are really not looking at a lot of the sinks on the agricultural landscape right now. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. Uh, the, the big sink in our state now though, is this category eight, land use, land use change and forestry. And in Delaware, it's primarily forestry. And that sector is offsetting about 4.6% of our total emissions. So that's important to keep that in mind. So with that, Denric is developing now a climate action plan. 
So they're they're working on the the details as we speak, and it'll probably be coming out within the the next couple of weeks, if not months. Um, and that plan is really looking at strategies to minimize those greenhouse gas emissions. But in my conversations with them, they've also said, well, you know, we, we've got to protect that sink that we already have, or else that's another 4.6% that somebody else, one of these other sectors is going to have to be responsible for reducing uh, th those emissions. Um, because if you don't protect and maintain those things, that carbon that's there is going to go back into the atmosphere. And um, it's, it's going to be a loss for all of us. So let's talk about what are natural and working lands. So the, we have in Delaware, about 38% of our landscape is agriculture. And it might even be a little bit more or less now because th these are 2012 numbers. 27% um, is forest. We have about 20% and is developed. And then wetlands and water make up seven and 8% roughly. So if you think about what natural and working lands are, they're really croplands and grasslands that falls into the agriculture category. Forests has its own category, wetlands, same, and then urban green spaces, which is a portion of that developed area. Granted, not all of developed areas are urban green spaces that you can manage for natural areas because people are going to still want to have ball fields. They're going to still want to have that mowed yard. But there are places within the developed sector where it can really be managed as a green area. So I wanted to move into agriculture first. So this is an area that I work in quite a bit. And um, I wanted to point out to the difference between sequestration and storage. You might hear me use both of those terms at different times. And carbon sequestration is really the process of removing carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So it's a rate, it's, you know, so many metric tons of CO2 equivalent per acre per year. That's in comparison to storage. That's really that carbon that is locked up in the biomass or in the soils themselves. So if we look here at this diagram from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you can see that there's a lot of things going on here. Um, we do have emissions, like I mentioned, we have, we have a cow here, there's methane emissions, methane coming out of some of the composting areas, um, carbon and nitrogen coming out of the cropland areas. You know, we, we apply fertilizer, including nitrogen, to all of our crops. And uh, corn especially, which we grow a lot of in Delaware, is not very efficient. There's a lot of opportunities for losing that nitrogen. So it could be uh, fixed back to the atmosphere or it could run off in different forms if, uh, through rain and, and leaching events. So it's really um, a, an area where you can do fine tuning with your, your nitrogen by um, controlling your nutrient applications. We can also see that we have crops here. I talked about sequestration and photosynthesis. So in an agricultural landscape, there are definitely plants. Some of those plants are annuals, then they, they are harvested. Um, sometimes, depending on what your crop you're growing is, it might be a perennial, it might be something that's there for more years, which is gonna have more of that woody biomass. And then there's a lot of conservation practices. My background is in water quality, as you heard from Lisa, and I've been working on uh, implementing best management practices to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus for many years now. So I know that we've put a lot of funding and efforts into putting buffers on farm fields and to doing a lot of other conservation practices that benefit water quality as well as habitat. Well, what we're finding is those same practices have carbon benefits too. So there's a, a program through the US Department of Agriculture that helps farmers uh, think about all of their conservation priorities, including climate change. And they group our um, ag BMPs, best management practices into five categories. The first one are the cropland management BMPs. It's what you're doing on that land where you're growing your cash crops. So you could do nutrient management. We have nutrient management laws here in Delaware. So all of our farmers are required to have a nutrient management plan. So that means they're probably putting on less nitrogen than when, and phosphorus than what they did before they had a nutrient management plan. Or they might be putting on the same amount, but they're putting it on smarter. They're putting it on when the crop needs it and using a method so that you're gonna minimize those losses. I talked about nitrogen is leaky. It might go to the atmosphere, it might run off into the water. If you're doing nutrient management planning, we're minimizing some of those uh, nitrous oxide emissions. So that's a greenhouse gas as well. So that's a, a benefit there. There's tillage practices too. So um, in traditional agriculture, you would till a field before you would plant it. You might come in and um, cultivate it when the crop is growing to try to keep the weed control down. Um, if you're doing tillage management practices, that means you're having fewer passes of that tractor tilling the ground and you're leaving the residue on that 
of the prior crop on the surface. And that has carbon in it. And so that carbon is now being built up and you're reducing emissions by having fewer tractor runs on that field. Now that third practice there are cover crops. So cover crops are the crops that you're planting on a field when your cash crop has already been harvested. So cover crops are great for a lot of environmental benefits. They control weeds, they uh, capture that extra nitrogen, they reduce erosion, and it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere and then starting to so uh, store it in the soils. And if you leave the cover crops there and they die and then you just plant your next crop into them, it's building up that carbon and um, giving you a higher carbon content of your soils. So the next two categories of practices are um, practices that take cropland out of production. So this is, you're either taking cropland and turning it into a grassy cover or you're turning it into a woody cover. Again, I mentioned buffers. Buffers are a big thing. These practices can be tricky and hard sells for farmers because they're, you're taking that land out of production. So you're not gonna make the profit and you're not gonna have the yield that you would have had if you had grown your cash crop there. However, there are some key areas where these are ideal practices. Again, next to some of our resource, resources that we're concerned about like waters or in underproductive areas. So there are places for these practices and, and we've done a lot over the last decade plus to really put um, government funds into funding these practices. The fourth category is for grazing lands. We don't have a lot of livestock in Delaware, but you can do things like prescribed grazing where you're moving the cattle or, or other livestock around. And some pasture, which is planting trees into a pasture area or taking a livestock um, breed of animal and moving it into a forested land. So you're kind of mixing trees and livestock together. And then the final category is restoration of disturbed lands. Um, and so in Delaware, that would be like that riparian restor restoration area. And we're fortunate we don't have a lot of um, disturbed areas either, but um, you could always do some stream bank restoration types of projects. So next I wanted to touch on wetlands. Um, and wetlands are a pretty complicated story. Um, they, we have tidal and non-tidal wetlands in Delaware, and um, we've seen a lot of wetland loss over the years as we've had development and changes in our land use. But you may have heard the term blue carbon. Blue carbon refers to all of the carbon that's stored in our world's oceans and coastal ecosystems. So wetlands are part of the coastal ecosystem, or those tidal wetlands are. It can be a kind of a complicated story here. Um, and the tidal, or non-tidal wetlands, sorry, in some cases, may end up being sources of carbon uh, at certain times of year and, and um, depending on how that wetland area is being managed. So the um, methods to quantify the benefits from these practices are really still under development, but the, the, the feeling is, is that collectively in total, uh, wetlands are a great place for storing carbon. So Blake, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you and let you take the next set of slides. All right. Okay, and this is where we left off, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, forested natural and working lands and then some of the things we can do either around our home or uh, in open space and, and things like that. So when you think of carbon, when I think of carbon sequestration, I think of, of organic material, right? So when you think of a lawn, it's not gonna be very good at sequestering carbon because there's not a whole lot there. You know, there's a little bit of grass there, there's some carbon in the soil and things like that. But when you compare it to how biomass there is in the woods, you just see, you can kind of see carbon in action, right? So there's carbon sequestered in, in trees and it's stored in there long-term. And, um, you know, and then also in the, the other bio, biomass that it is on the ground. So when trees drop their leaves, that's carbon dropping down to the forest floor and remaining there until it decomposes. And part of the decomposition, it's gonna go back into the atmosphere, sure, but then there's gonna be other parts of it that go into the soil and you get your, soil, your carbon sequestered there as well. Understory vegetation, you know, if you have a really healthy forest where it's not just, you know, it's not just the trees, but you have a healthy understory, you got another opportunity for carbon sequestration and storage there as well. And then your deadwood. So when, when you have trees that, that um, you know, they, they go and they, they go through their life cycle, they die or they get out competed. Um, this is a good reason to keep them in the forest. You know, one of the reasons is carbon sequestration. That is carbon right there in the solid form sitting there on the, 
on the forest floor that will take many years for it to break down and go back into the atmosphere. And as we talked about earlier, some of those co-benefits, you know, that's going to create habitat for, for some of your, your woodland uh, species. So just um, forests are just a powerhouse when it comes to carbon sequestration. And, and like I said, when you start to think about carbon as organic material, um, and that's how it's sequestered, you can see the big difference between a forest and turf per se, and see how much, see how that would be uh, a big, a big opportunity. So what are we doing with forests and natural and working lands? Um, one of the biggest thing is, is avoided conversion. I think Jen mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, pr protect your existing forests. We have uh, several hundred thousand acres of forest land in Delaware that, that um, you know, needs protecting. Um, you know, we actually have more now than we did earlier in the 1900s. And that's mainly because of the conversion of, of, of former ag land into, into forests. And just kind of continuing that, you know, we have a program that I think just began to be recently funded again, and that's the Forest Land Conservation uh, Preservation Program run through the Delaware Forest Service. You know, that's an opportunity to preserve uh, land that's already in forests. And that's another thing. So forests are mainly privately owned nationwide, but even more so in Delaware. So, you know, one of the things that we'd love to do is, is reach folks who have woodlands, like we have several people here, to kind of show like what you're giving back to, to the natural world, not only with the, the, you know, having water quality benefits, having habitat and biodiversity benefits, but you're also helping with, with, with climate change as well with your carbon sequestration. Um, and as she said, existing forests already offset 4.6% of the gross statewide emissions. And if you saw her numbers there, 4% um, of, of carbon emissions are, are um, given out by the ag sectors. So ag sectors are already offset by the, the, the existing forests, forests um, doing that kind of work. So you already have that already there. So if we lose our forests, there's, like, like Jen said, we're going to end up um, having more emissions that somebody else is going to have to work to, to reduce. And another thing we can do is, is increase what our forests are already doing or increase the amount of forested land we have in Delaware. You'll hear a term called afforestation, which is simply creating new forests. So taking some of those open spaces, you know, whether they're along roadways maybe or, or other rights of way where you can plant trees or in your open spaces and HOAs, places that aren't already forest being converted to forest land is called afforestation. And obviously, like we were talking about earlier, the amount of, of carbon that is uh, stored in trees is, is probably your best bet when you're talking about national and working lands. Now, the caveat to that is, is that old growth forests, which we don't have any in Delaware, old growth, I mean, you know, you've probably seen several definitions of that, but old growth forests get to a point where they're no longer a sink. They've reached a point where they're really not putting on that much extra biomass, where they're gonna be actually uh, offsetting carbon emissions. Um, and they end up actually giving off more carbon than they're going to sequester at that point, which is why you'll see some of the uh, forest managers throughout the country, um, Delaware Forest Service is a good example of this, is how they manage their state forests. You know, they do rotational management practices, whether it's thinning, whether it's harvesting for, for wood products, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, you know, helps with carbon storage. And the key is letting what is harvested or what is thin, those areas grow back up in forest land, because then you have the storage on the stuff that's been harvested and maybe used for houses for long-term garbage storage. Then you also have the new growth that's coming. And so some of those faster growing trees, such as poplar is a good example, how fast that grows, you're getting that carbon sequestration there and it's doing it at a fast rate. Maybe over time it sequesters the same amount of carbon as say some of the slower growing oaks or cedars. Um, but in the short term, you're going to get your most benefit with some of those faster growing species. So there's a lot of that that goes into to forest management practices. Um, and the Delaware Forest Action Plan is out there. You can look that up and it's, it's, um, it's put together by the Delaware Forest Service and other partners. And you can kind of see how the Forest Service uh, approaches their forest-wide management, whether it's for private owners, whether it's for their state forests, or whether it's in the urban sector. And some of the, the, the practices, they're going to be managing for pests and disease and invasive species. And those are really so you prevent some of those catastrophic fire uh, instances that you see out west. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've had over the years of only you can prevent forest fires. 
and it's good that that we're we're being careful in those areas. But our our forest management has not included a lot of prescribed fire over time, and that's that. What that does is you get a, an increased amount of, of biomass. So yeah, you're storing extra carbon with that, but then you have those more catastrophic wildfires that you see that we've been experiencing lately, and then that's just this big influx of carbon back into the atmosphere that that that's just not it's not good and and it can't be you know it's kind of like a, a smokestack giving carbon directly back in there so it's it's one of those things where if if forest management practices are put in place to you know thin out some of the the areas that are too heavy have prescribed fires every so often make it so that carbon is more slowly released in some areas and also you'll get those um, you know, prescribed burns what may promote some understory growth as well. So there's a lot that goes into forest management that not only helps biodiversity and habitat, but, um, you know, climate as well. I saw a chatting here. Yeah, it's like R Renee may want to unmute. She, she asked, um, beyond carbon sequestration, are we weighing the animal species? So is it the carbon stored in the animals? No, I think... The support. <laughs> okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, there is... This way above my pay grade on exactly how they go about managing their forests. But yes, everything is taken into account when they go in there. And especially on, on national, nationally owned land or, or uh, state owned land, that forest management that's going into there is definitely taking that into consideration. And also any private landowner who enters into a forest management plan with, say, the Delaware Forest Service, they're going to be paying particular attention to that. Now, when a private landowner, uh, if they wanted to clear cut their land and there's, you know, I don't know what, what's going into that decision there. Um, that's, that's the key of us getting the education and outreach out to those, those folks. Is that kind of what you were, you were getting at there? Yeah, I just, I'm just thinking we, we, we often skip the complexity of the analysis Oh, absolutely. Focus on one thing, and that I was just asking that question in regard to, to, to the species that uh, an old sure. growth forest supports. Absolutely, and that's why where if you if you take a look at the the forest action plan and seeing all the different things that that goes into decisions that are made on that level, it's a good example on on you know that sustainable proper forest management. And I'm not believe me, I'm not recommending cutting down old growth forests or anything like that. I'm just kind of giving out that, that uh, you know, that some decisions are made to help, um, you know, it, whether it's sequestering carbon or whether it's just, you know, helping the forest become more, uh, you know, back to some of its younger days. So urban green spaces, this is another big opportunity that I, I love talking about. You know, it goes hand in hand with some of the sustainable landscaping. Um, you know, traditionally you have areas in the urban landscape where there's just, there's nothing there, um, you know, where there's opportunity. So even just planting one tree, um, you know, has the water quality benefits, has the climate benefits, has the habitat benefits, um, you know, there's opportunity there. And urban forest buffers, you know, there's a lot of disturbed areas around, uh, around you know, urban settings, even suburban settings, like open spaces and developments is a good example, you know, that have opportunity to either, you know, turn it into a forest, a small forest or a meadow or something where there's just more biomass and less um, mowers just going over that and less fertilizer going into the system and things like that. Um, you got your urban riparian restoration, similar to, to the ag spaces where those, they, they need to have buffers there to help water quality, but then it's also an opportunity to, to have more uh, carbon sequestration. Conversa con conservation landscaping is the same. It's uh, around your home. You know, what can you do around your home to, to, you know, help with all of these things that we keep talking about? And I'll keep hammering it down where it's biodiversity and habitat, water quality, climate, all of these things, you, you'll get a benefit. Now, it's hard to, to necessarily put a number on it sometimes, which I'll talk about in a second. But these are some of the things you can do. Up top here, you see this is a, a rain garden um, that could be planted in, in some of your areas that, that may need a little bit better drainage. And this, this is an area where you know, you're, you're helping with water quality directly there. You're giving uh, pollinator habitat and food sources there. And also the biomass is, is not 
is helping sequester a little bit of carbon, but then you're also not having that repeated uh, mowing uh, in that area that probably normally would have happened. Um, you can see there's opportunities to plant small trees. This one down here on the left is in my front yard. I planted it um, probably, let's say about six years ago now, and it looked like the, the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, and this is what it's turned into. You know, it's done a pretty good job in the front yard there. And, you know, when it's looking like this in the spring, which it's about to and probably like, I'd say a week or two, this is an Eastern red bud, um, be covered in, in pollinators. Pollinator. So it's good early, uh, early source of that. But again, it's also, you know, giving a small amount of carbon sequestration there. So it's just an opportunity that if one person does it, and then 10 people do it, then 100, you know, it, it can grow over time. So just because, you know, you think you have a small area, just, just putting in, in that type of effort can, can add, end up adding up in the long term. So what are some of the goals that, that are, are in the nat natural and working lands um, sector? Um, you know, obviously maintain and increase funding for implementation and preservation. You know, preservation is huge. You know, it's, it's, it helps protect against losing uh, lots of forest land to development. Um, and it's also, you know, most of these preservation programs and Delaware is definitely one, they have to have that forest management plan in there. So that maintenance will be involved in it as well. So it should be a healthy forest. Um, improved tracking and reporting of all practices and land uses. This is, this is probably one of the more difficult things to do because this is what we want um, to find a baseline of where we are right now. Like what, what are our current forests holding as far as, as carbon is concerned and, and you know, what are the benefits that we're going to be receiving if we change practices or we do, um, you know, if afforestation, if we're able to do some more acres of planting for us and things like that. You know, that's one of the biggest, biggest issues that we've been running into now to know exactly what we're doing and what benefits we're getting. And it, that's to that point as well, research to quantify the benefits from all practices. Now, I know there's a lot of work being done on that right now. I know the University of, of Maryland um, is working on that pretty heavily to try to to track what's going on in forests in the region. National level, there's a lot of work going on. Um, we've been a part of, of uh, I think it's the Northeast Climate Hub and they've been putting on um, opportunities for us to connect with other, other managers in the, in the region to try to find out what the best uh, uses of our time and, and where we're gonna get the most bang for our buck in, in natural and working lands. So you'll see this expand and develop new wood and forest product markets. You know, again, it's one of those things where carbon stored in a piece of lumber that goes into a house is going to be stored away from the atmosphere for a long time. And so one of the things that I've seen um, that they're working on in some urban settings is kind of using more wood instead of some of the uh, the steel that's normally used. And it's just, just to keep that carbon stored. And again, this has got to be done with sound force management practices. You know, I'm not advocating for clear cutting or doing anything like that, but just being able to have those car that carbon stored long-term will help us. Support new carbon markets. Um, you know, I think Jim touched on that a little bit earlier, but it's really, um, you know, where where companies who pollute, who actually put carbon into the atmosphere, can pay land managers or landowners to have carbon sink for some of their for their carbon benefit. Um, so you can actually make money by having a healthy forest. And increase education, outreach, and assistance. You know, again, trying to leverage the BMPs that we're using for water quality and habitat conservation and things like that and showing that there's also greenhouse gas benefits and, and putting, getting more money put in that pot to, in order to help with implementation. Again, we've, we, I keep wanting to hammer this home that we're talking about climate change and natural and working lands and sequestering carbon. By just by doing this type of thing, you get the co-benefits of, of, of these practices where water quality, you know, if you're doing um, you know, a forested buffer next to some of these agricultural ditches that are not, not healthy for the ecosystem in the most part. If you're putting forested buffers along those, how much of a benefit you get for water quality, for habitat, for biodiversity, for, for, for uh, carbon sequestration. 
you know, and they can also use those more disturbed areas instead of disturbing a, a intact forest. Maybe this is an opportunity where they can do timber production or something like that. Um, you know, smart forest management, where if you have to thin an area to make a more healthy forest, you know, you can use that into the, the, the wood products market. So again, existing practices on cropland, forests, and urban green spaces, they do provide climate benefits while also giving those benefits as well. You know, I understand that, you know, at times agriculture is, is gets a bad name, but there is a lot of, of conservation practices that are going on by farmers. You know, they do want to be good, good stewards of the land and, and are open to all these practices that have been studying and, and have been, um, you know, uh, sent out to them like cover crops is, is a perfect example where you know cover crops was not a widespread used um, um, ag practice until you know recently where it's just it's exploded because the funding is there the research is there for the benefits that that they get from doing so you know they're willing and able but you know they also have to be able to to, to provide food for everyone as well so it, it's us helping uh, helping them expand their, their conservation efforts. It's kind of one of the things that Chen and I do a lot of work on. And protecting, protecting and managing land, you know, conservation, that's what it is, right? You know, we're a lot of us, um, you know, in our field, that's, that's what we focus on. You know, we want to make sure that we're able to give the education and outreach and the resources that folks have to, to just make better decisions. And, you know, when you make better decisions for, for conservation, it usually has a lot of, a lot of co-benefits. All right, I think that is all. And Jen, do you have anything to add that I missed? No, I think you did a great. Lisa, right. do we have any questions? Renee, what's WHL? <laughs> oh, you're muted. <laughs> Those were the initials on the last slide. And, and it's working land something, right? Or oh, whatever and what the initials. I'm always like, why can't people just say what they mean instead of giving me initials? Anyway, we have help, a an, old, help an old growth person out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we're gonna go into the breakout rooms now. So we have a limited amount of time um, and there's facilitators in each room. So we've got some questions. We break this up into two pieces. One is sharing some personal perspectives. And then the second part is taking action. So we've got a lot of questions. So just to help limit them a little bit, um, if you could maybe the facilitators got the personal perspective ones and you can even go around and answer them quickly without getting into too much conversation, just to get a sense of, of the, of where you all are. And then you might wanna take a little more time in the taking action, especially in intrigued with the piece about connecting personal green spaces to create corridors um, and, and actually understanding what your own resources are and how you can connect them together. So I'm going to take us into our rooms now and I'll give you a heads up when I'm gonna be bringing you back. Um, let's see. And if you can all open your videos up, if you don't mind, I will take a quick screenshot. Smile. Anyone who's willing. Say Rubecchia. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. One, two. See, Mary, you're going to join us? Okay, here we go. Thank you, everybody. All right, here we go.